Searching the web for the most talented, creative, and intriguing independent authors. The Emmett Blackwell Show, diving into the creative minds of sci-fi, fantasy, horror, and paranormal authors. Their fantasy is our reality. Hello and welcome once again to the Emmett Blackwell Show. Thank you for listening and don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. On this episode, I'll be speaking with our literary hero, Annie Acorn. She currently owns and operates Annie Acorn Publishing, LLC. She writes cozy mysteries and has never had to experience writer's block. We will talk about how she approaches the beginning of writing a story, how she has avoided writer's block, and her previous writing careers. This is an amazing amount of information, and I really encourage you to listen. So, without any further ado, let's begin. And how are you doing today, Annie? I'm doing fine. It's a pleasure to be here. Oh, well, thank you very much. Now, your books are considered cozy mysteries. Would you care to explain what type of genre this, this cozy mysteries thing is? Well, obviously, it's a type of mystery, usually <laughs> revolving around a murder, but not necessarily so. Uh, to be considered a true cozy, it shouldn't include violence beyond what is absolutely necessary to produce a corpse who immediately becomes the body and therefore non-personal. Mm -hmm. And it should also not have a lot of raw sex, although romance is often a component. Mm -hmm. uh, the cast of characters needs to be limited because the reader hopes to solve the mystery slash puzzle before the denouement at the end of the book. Uh, the main sleuth is often an amateur, although a professional is often in the wings to provide access to autopsy results and information about poisons and stuff like that. I would add that, um, in my opinion, the puzzle should also be fair, mm -hmm. by which I mean that enough clues have to be laid along the path to make it possible for an astute reader to reach the correct answer near or at the end of the book. And you don't want it to happen too early. I actually started writing my first mystery because I was guessing the mysteries I was reading. <laughs> it was very frustrating. Uh, and I should say the um, the current mysteries I was reading. I didn't have that problem with the uh, old uh, British ones, for instance. Mm -hmm. And I would define having solved the murder as you're being able to correctly identify the motive and name the murderer by being able to explain both why he or she could have done it and why no one else could have based on what's in the story. Yeah, that sounds interesting. It seems like there's a lot of qualifications for something like that. But just like you were saying, you know, the old mysteries, it's almost as if something like that could have been put on a stage show, you know, and, and, you know, I've seen a lot of stage shows that kind of, I guess I probably have seen a lot more cozy mysteries than what I've uh, realized, but yeah, I know what you're talking about. Now, when did you actually begin writing? Well, I joke that while some people are born with a silver spoon in their mouth, <laughs> I was born with a pencil. Um, <laughs> I learned it to read very early in part because my paternal grandmother and great aunt lived in the other half of the duplex that was our home. So I was the only child among adults for three years and pretty much really for five because my sister was too young to really be read to or do anything. So I read very, very early. Then I had the advantage of a maternal grandmother who was in charge of quality control for Donnelly's Printing Company in Crawfordsville, Indiana, and she would send pads of paper and books with blank pages that had been made there at the shop out of, you know, leftover paper or uh, incorrectly put together books. And we had those around the house all the time. So before I was in school, I was copying other people's books onto these pads and into these blank books, just literally copying other people's words. And then it was just a tiny step before I was writing my own words, which had always sort of been streaming in my head. Mm -hmm. 
And it wasn't until really I was a teenager that I can literally remember a moment when we were driving through the Smoky Mountains in East Tennessee looking at the foliage. And we came around a curve in the National Park that provided us with a panoramic view off to my right. And it suddenly dawned on me that as I was visually enjoying the scene, a description of it was streaming through my mind as if I was reading it off a page. And that was the moment when I sort of connected the dots and realized that I... Who I was was that I had always heard words that needed to be written in my mind in the same way that a composer would hear music in their mind. Mm-hmm. Exactly. And, and you know, it's the, just always there. Yeah. Yeah. And the funny thing is, because you are a writer, you're also a very astute communicator. OK. And the fact that you've had to even do this in your career, you were a technical writer for ARC, which is the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality, NIH, which is the National Institute of Health and SAMHSA, which is the Substitute Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, which is a huge mouthful. <laughs> and <laughs> and uh, you were on contract with the University of Maryland. Has technical writing helped you with organizing your fictional writing? Actually, no, um, Hmm. but only because my high school English and history teacher, we had a combined studies program, and she was my teacher for three years. Her name was Mrs. Ledgerwood, and she had already done that for me. Logically, writing and developing a paper was really her lasting gift to me, both when I double majored in history and English in college and then throughout my business life as I was a casualty insurance adjuster and had to write reports, when I was involved in the writing of marketing materials, when I wrote proposals and business plans for my own business, and eventually then the technical writing I did for the government agencies. That having been said, if I hadn't already had that skill, technical writing would certainly have demanded that I acquire it, although it's important to remember that there's a lot more freedom in fiction writing, particularly Mm -hmm. in dialogue. Women, uh, for instance, I have a son who uh, is a poet and, and a writer, and he pointed out when he read one of my very early works, he said, Mom, I I know it was written by a woman. Hmm. And I said, really? And he said, I always know when it's written by a woman. And he said, it's because of your dialogue. Women tend to speak in full sentences, and men don't. Hmm. And I started listening, and sure enough, he's right. Now, that's not to say that a man will never speak in a complete sentence, because often they do. But they're also quickest to cut a sentence. Mm -hmm. They'll say, come here instead of you come here. You see what I mean? Mm -hmm. So it's not that it's wrong. It's just shortened, and ever since then, I've been very aware of that. It was just a neat tip coming from left field completely, and very true. Yeah, and, you know, one thing, you know, is organization, and I'm wondering, like, because of all the things that you've written, what what is one thing that, that has helped you with organizing your, your ideas? Well, it depends, it depends on the work. I, I have written nonfiction as well as fiction. With a nonfiction, I usually get an idea for a book, and then I will maybe do a few bullet points just of ideas that I want to be sure and incorporate in the book mm-hmm. in an orderly fashion. But I am not an outline writer. Hmm. Yeah, everybody has their own been. style, yeah. Right. And to me, when I'm writing the fiction, and, and I tell this to the authors that I work with all the time, I always start out, and I think it's important for any story to kind of start out with, it can start out with an action scene, but then almost immediately it has to provide the reader with a basic who, what, when, where, why, so that they're comfortable with where they are. What century? Are they in a house? Are they out in the middle of a field? Is it winter, summer, spring? Are they in danger? You know, where are they? who's with them, (laughs) you know, what is the slice of time at which we're meeting them. And that has to be accomplished in a minimum of words relatively quickly in, say, the first half of the first page, if possible, if the action goes longer than as soon as the action is completed. And um, that's hard for people to understand. But once you get past that, the quickest, easiest way for a writer to get into the story and really begin writing 
the rest of it, so to speak, is to get right into dialogue and just let their characters do the talking instead of writing the dialogue for them. Your your characters are the story. It's their story. Mm-hmm. They're not characters in a play that you're a screenwriter and have written for them. And I think most people, when they say that they have writer's block, what's really happening is they're trying to force their character into a situation or a position that isn't them. And they won't go there. (laughs) They just won't. That's the first time I think I've heard of that. And it really does make a lot of sense. I mean, the writer's block is a big issue for a lot of people. But when you're trying to force a story, it's almost like you're just moving people from one place to another. And just, I mean, really, I think you've solved the entire writer's block scenario here. Uh, it would be, it, would, it does make sense. Because <laughs> does it help to know that I have never had writer's that's, block? That's good. That, that means that you're really in close connection with your characters. And that's amazing because they're just like people in your life, you know? Well, um, they are. They're very real. And as soon as I start writing a story, it doesn't, it's not something I intentionally do. It's just there. I can tell you that we always meet a character at a slice of time in their life, mm-hmm. okay? Be it a short story, a novel, novelette, doesn't matter. But as the author, I immediately know everything about them. I know if they were abused as a child. I know what their education level is. I know what their goals are. I know what they look like. I know their name. They name themselves. I'm horrible at naming characters. <laughs> I will name every character in the same book with a name that starts with a J. Oh, and yeah. That's me. So, in fact, sometimes in desperation, I will look at books on my shelf and pick a first name of an author and the last name of another, and that's how I'll name a character. But it very rarely lasts because the character wants to be someone else so that's what happens because otherwise it just doesn't work but I literally um, put together a writer's group one time right before I started um, Annie Acorn Publishing and one of the women who came this one Sunday afternoon said to me you know I'm having writer's block and what do I do and she was looking at me with these eyes full of trust well I'd never had it but I had read about it I'd heard about it I'd heard other people <laughs> pontificate on it so I told her you know what basically I thought made sense and after they all left, it was Sunday afternoon, I was tired, I had my laptop, I threw up in a Word doc, and I thought, you know, I'm going to sit here and I'm going to see if I, if what I told them actually works, because I've never done it. <laughs> so, I, at the time, I was really editing Chocolate Can Kill. Mm. I was not writing, I, I had no active work in progress as a writer. So I threw open this, this Word doc with no pre-notion of anything, and I sat there looking at this blank page, which luckily I had saved, and I said, okay, is this a short story, a novel, a novelette? And I thought, well, let's make it the beginning of a novel. Is the main character a man or a woman? Are they old, middle-aged, young? Well, the character in Chocolate Can Kill is middle-aged, so I made it a woman in her late 20s. She was a recent widow. What is the size of time? Where is she? I had been writing about the East Coast, so I put her outside of Seattle up on Puget Sound. Uh, what does she look like? I got a description. What's her name? I just threw out a name. And what is the size of time at which we find her? And the size of time I chose was that she was standing across the street from a storefront on which were written the words Bright Treasures. There was the store story that her husband had wanted to have. And it was antiques, um, gift items, that sort of thing, and artwork. And she's stepping off the curb to go open the store after he has, she's now realized, been murdered. Mm-hmm. And my goal was to just see if I could write a thousand words. So I dashed off a thousand words. And about the time I finished, uh, one of the gals that had been there called to thank me, and she said, what have you been doing since we left? And I told her, and she said, well, read it to me, and I did. She said, that's great. She said, you write another thousand tomorrow. Mm-hmm. So I did. And every day I had to come home and call up Elizabeth and read her the thousand words that I had written on my lunch hour at work. Mm-hmm. 
And I did this for 90 days and ended up with the mystery. And this was in 2011. The mystery that I've just brought out in ebook form, <laughs> finally, <laughs> called Bright Treasures. But literally, at about 87,000 words, she said to me, I can hardly wait to see how this finishes. And wow. I said, I can't either. <laughs> because I had no idea. I had no plot. <laughs> I mean, well, and you know, I had l- honestly, literally just like the characters write this book, and it turned out beautifully. And I never had to go back and add, and it is a cozy mystery. I never had to go back and add a single clue. They were all there. It was just uh, the neatest thing I think that's ever happened. Well, one of them, and with the writing, but it does work. I mean, if you'll just let those characters tell the story, you will have a story and churn out a thousand words a day for ninety days. Mm-hmm. But I mean, really, though, I mean, one thing when it comes to writing is the daunting task of creating characters, a plot, and a scene that they're in. Okay, and I think that honestly, you've done an excellent job at simplifying that for everybody who's listening because it really it is a, a series of questions that you need to ask yourself about what you're really doing. And that right there, I mean, honestly, perfect uh, attack on how you're going to approach these stories because it is amazing that, you know, your mind works in that way. You know, <laughs> it's really cool. Right. Um, well, now, the, the point is, I'm really, it isn't, I'm giving up my mind. Mm-hmm. I, I'm turning it over to them. That's good. I I pull myself back from it, and I think that's really the key, is to let the story unfold. And and my authors will ask me over and over again, how many words does this need? I just say, just tell your story. Mm -hmm. Because the minute you put word, I'm not saying production words, I want to write a thousand words today, it's a good thing. But I'm saying when you say this has to be done, I have to make this 10,000 words longer. I want this to be a 40,000 word novel, or I want this mm-hmm. to be a full When you put that limit on it or that goal on it, either way, then you're forcing it. Mm-hmm. And the more you step back from it, just let it flow because creativity is a flow. Wow. Now, you can force yourself to write something. I mean, I tweet out that I wrote a 45 page you know, final report to Samson in three days. Believe me, that was that was just churning out words. <laughs> but that that was nonfiction. When it's fiction, it's got to flow. And a lot of people will say, if you're blocked, take a walk. I think that does help because you're in somewhere else. Your mind goes somewhere else, and that allows your subconscious to churn and bring it up to you. Or read read what you've written right before you go to bed, go to sleep, and your dream process will do it as your brain sorts what you went through, the data you went through during the day. Uh, another good thing uh, I've asked, I've mentioned to other people who say they've had a problem uh, and they've said work for them is just to write something else. Just, just open a Word doc and say, okay, I'm just going to write three paragraphs about a prompt that has nothing to do with my story. And for some reason, that seems to take the pressure off the story you're really wanting to write. Mm-hmm. I can't explain that. I'm not a doctor, but I probably went on interviews. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, um, but I think those things can help. But the main thing, I think, is just to let your characters tell their story. If you know them, then it's logical. Mm-hmm. And so I, I will write my thousand words that I'm I'm writing for that day. And I set that goal. Sometimes it's less, sometimes it's more. I go back in the next day, and I will allow myself to go back and edit just those thousand words, just so that I get that voice in my head that I wrote them in, uh, so that I remember exactly where they were, what they were doing, and then I say, okay, logically, what would happen next? Who, Who would take the ball at this point in the conversation or action? Making sure that that ping pong ball is going, for instance, with a romance from the alpha male to the alpha female to, you know, Mm -hmm. so you're getting the same character development 
level of character development for each of them throughout the work. Mm -hmm. Now, we talked a little bit, too, uh, about, you know, all the other things that you had been involved in. And you had actually owned a tri-state medical outsourcing business, a retail company. You managed cemeteries, which I I have a hard time believing. It's it's crazy. Oh, I did. But it would be fun. Um, (laughs) And you also directed a behavioral health care company. How did you decide to land on publishing and writing? I mean, obviously, you have a passion for it. You have a love for it. But what made you finally say, you know what, this is me? Uh, I mean, well, first of all, it is me. That's who I am. Mm -hmm. I've written, you know, in every every business I've ever owned, there's been a component of writing. You know, be it marketing, or in fact, I think that's why I've been told I write very good blurbs, and I must do fairly well because they sell the books, (laughs) which Mm -hmm. is the key. Uh, But they're advertising copy. Mm -hmm. And you never in a blurb want to give a summary of your story because if you've told them your story in a three-paragraph blurb, they have no reason to buy the story. Yeah, understood. Does that make sense? Oh, yeah, it does. And you know, one (laughs) thing, too, is the communication factor. You know, I mean, you think about it, every one of your jobs that you've done, every one of the agencies that you've worked for or been contracted to, they're all about communicating. And and honestly, I kind of wish that they taught more about this in school, about communicating with people, because it really does break down barriers and it gets things done. And just like with um, your medical outsourcing business, your retail company, and I mean, managing cemeteries, I'm not sure if you're talking to dead people, but still, you know, (laughs) it's like... Only on Wednesday. (laughs) Only only on Wednesday. Uh, But yeah, it's true. You know, you, you have to be able to communicate and with everything that you've done, I mean, it's amazing that you've landed on publishing because, I mean, you have a heart of a writer, and to help other people is is amazing to me. So along with well, your writing, uh, with the Cozy Mysteries, you also run the publishing company. Um, would you care to tell us about the publishing company, how it got started? Well, that was uh, – I backed into it. Um, I did, as you say, I owned a tri-state medical outsourcing business, which I had started from scratch, which um, Inc. Magazine says an entrepreneur is certifiably crazy because basically you're <laughs> jumping off a high dive into a pool without knowing if there's any water in it. Um, what you probably will not believe is that I actually did all four of those things that you listed at the same time. No way. No, I did. Oh. <laughs> in Birmingham, Alabama, um, the tri-state <laughs> outsourcing business I started in 87 and ran it until 03. Uh, the retail company I flipped from mm. May to September of 95. It was a comics and collectibles mm. uh, chain of five stores. Then um, I, the behavioral health care center, a friend of mine who was a sociologist wanted to put together a group and he had no business. None of them had any business experience. So he begged me and bribed me and a couple of us, <laughs> uh, yeah, to get me to take on just forming the company for them. And I had to do some behavioral health care work and also then marketing it for the top two thirds of Alabama, which I was marketing for my own company so I could sort of do them together. Uh, but I backed into managing the cemeteries because I was a recent widow and I wanted to help other widows get through it. And in order to do family service work and work with the widows, I had to sell the products. I told them I'm not a salesperson, but I can educate them, you know, as to what's available. I outsold everybody because I wasn't a salesperson and wasn't pushing anything. Mm -hmm. (laughs) So I ended up managing them. Um, But by the time I I moved away from my business and moved up here to the Mid-Atlantic because all that was happening in Birmingham, I had determined that I would never ever, ever again own a business. I never wanted to rent a building again. I never wanted to deal with fax machines and phone systems and, you know, all of that. And I never wanted to deal with payroll again. Well, now look at (laughs) you. So I was never going to have another business. Fast forward uh, to... 2011, and really more like 2009, the government started cutting back on all of these agencies, Mm -hmm. and the company that I was doing the contract writing through was winning the projects, but they then would not be funded, and so they were laying people off, and one of the people that I worked with had an interest in e-marketing, and uh, he had 
approached me several times and said to me, you know, I know how to market, and but I don't have any product. You probably have file cabinets full of stories. And I said, oh, file cabinets, boxes, steamer truck. <laughs> <You know, laughs> yes, I do. I've got it. And he kept saying, you need to do this, you need to do this, you need to do this, because he knew, you know, that our time there might be limited as it was. It, it wasn't particularly limited, but I had no way to know that. So finally, one day I said to him, okay, I'm going to let you talk me into this. Um, three of us got together and had him come over to my house, and he was going to help us set up our websites and get on Twitter and Facebook and all of this sort of thing, show us how to use GIMP so we could do covers, mm-hmm. which was really a disaster. Um, the best thing I ever did was find a graphic designer. <laughs> and um, anyway, as I was sitting there taking you know, extensive notes in case I ever had to explain to someone else how to do it, as someone who had owned businesses, I was seeing a hole. I knew from things that were hitting the Washington Post and um, on Facebook and what have you that, you know, indie authors were really growing in number. John Locke had just written his book on how he had been the first person on Amazon to sell, I think it was a million ebooks. Mm-hmm. And um, there was a lot of interest in it. And I just was seeing in my mind these men and women sitting at a kitchen table struggling with maybe the next great American novel and no way to get from that point to where Andre was taking us because of his technical knowledge. Mm -hmm. And so I had always wanted to mentor authors, and I said to myself, self, (laughs) maybe this is something you should do, you know. Because if I mentored authors, I had a problem in that if I helped them upload the book, then royalties were going to be paid, and I had to pay those royalties out. And the best way to do that would be, obviously, through a company. Mm -hmm. (laughs) So what we do, we're actually, in in reality, almost a completely virtual company. We're all over the country, the graphic designers in Missouri, you know, we're everywhere. The authors are all over the world when I'm in Australia. Um, but in this day and age, it works, and I'm pretty amazed at myself being completely non-technical and verbal, <laughs> <laughs> that I have a company like this, but I don't have a building. We do meet occasionally to do things. We have regular meetings um, at a very nice restaurant, some of us, twice a year to do planning sessions. Um, most of the editing is done by, via phone and email. I mean, you don't really have to be together mm-hmm. you know, to make it work. So I have no building, I have no fax machine, I have no copy machine, I have no phone system. And we pay everybody on 1099s, mm-hmm. including the technical manager, including um, the graphic designer, uh, the authors, everybody. Wow. So uh, it's, an, it's a different kind of company, but it works really well. And it is an actual company. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's an LLC. We you know, pay Maryland for the privilege of being here. <laughs> <laughs> so now, this is a traditional publishing house. Publishing house. How do people submit their manuscripts to Annie Acorn Publishing? Well, at this moment, they don't because okay. we we're not accepting <laughs> a little bit overloaded submissions. There. Uh, although I probably receive an email a week mm-hmm. because uh, the my email there is an email they can use um, both on the website and um, at the end of my books. So you know, I do get and occasionally I have gone, oh, geez, this one is so good, or this one's so good. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I, I'm my worst enemy when it comes to that. Um, I have been told that they will tie my hands behind my back so I can't key or reply if I don't <laughs> stop <laughs> by those. Well, I mean, I've, I've checked out the website. Is- it is massive. I mean, you cover not just cozy mysteries. You cover paranormal. You cover horror. You cover just about all of them. And it's it's amazing to me that a company that got started and really kind of got launched off in 2011, let's just call it 2011, has grown so big with so many authors underneath you, and you still don't have a fax machine. <laughs> I mean, it's really, it's it's a very impressive thing. And I thing. don't miss it. <laughs> <laughs> Even better. <laughs> but I, I never intended it for it to be this size. Mm-hmm. Never, ever. 
Uh, we were basically we were very lucky. Well, we were very lucky, and I had owned and operated several other businesses mm -hmm. successfully. So this is my sixth business, so uh, successful business. So um, they've all been successful, but there've been six of them. Um, and business is business is business. Mm -hmm. um, you're chasing your tail financially on the covers and that sort of thing, and you've got to confine, confine growth. Um, I did um, two things that, that were smart. Uh, one uh, was that I got I, I lucked into really an excellent graphic designer, mm -hmm. and I literally went out and I, I tried to do a mentoring program with a local community college, thinking that the hardest thing for a graphic designer is to get references, and you know we could kind of do a a joint thing, grow together, sort of. That uh, they were interested in, but we never could quite get it working. So I finally one day in desperation just Googled, you know, graphic designers and over on the right there was an ad and I clicked on it and inside of it I filled out a little thing, you know, I want it to be a woman, I want them to be within the continental US, I want to pay within this range, blah, 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 you know, and up popped five people. Mm -hmm. And I looked through them and I immediately knew which one I wanted. She was the youngest least experienced, and her website was just, her artwork was fantastic. Mm -hmm. It just leapt off the page. And so I called Andre into my office at, uh, where we were both working, uh, where I was doing the contract writing, and I said, I want you to look at this list, and I want you to tell me which one you think I should use. Mm -hmm. And he hit on exactly the same one. <laughs> That's good. And it just, I, I was amazed because I really didn't expect that. I thought, I'm just that crazy, but he's really solid and serious. Mm -hmm. <laughs> he's not going to pick up on that one. But he did. And it just turned out, it was happenstance that at the time she was living in Prattville, Alabama. I was still traveling back to Birmingham to speak with the Birmingham Area Writers Group. And I, I also have a son that's still there. And so we were actually able to meet. I was able to see her design covers, which was extremely helpful to me then in discussing covers with her down the road. I was able to give her what she really needed mm -hmm. to have some vision of where I wanted to go. So that was number one. <clears throat> number two, if you're going to start a publishing company, is okay. Uh, we're brand new. We have no, you know, nothing to appeal to anybody. Um, how do we attract authors? And I knew that almost every writer I knew had a Christmas story or a holiday story of some sort that they had written, and there was virtually no way to publish it. Hmm. And so, <clears throat> because used to, you could put them in a magazine, but now magazines rarely had them. Magazines, there weren't even that many of them anymore. Mm -hmm. And if they did publish a Christmas story at Christmas, it was a staff writer mm -hmm. or their author of the year. So I said, okay, let's put together a Christmas treasury. You know, everybody pull out your story. We'll put them to, we'll put a Christmas treasury out. And we did. Mm -hmm. And it sold. It still sells. It sells every month. Wow. People read our Christmas treasuries on the beach in August. You know, it's, those, it's like those people that listen to Christmas music in July. I'm one of those people. And <laughs> oh, I love it. Oh, I'm drinking out of a Santa Claus mug. What are you talking about? Like, but I have to do it because I have to write Christmas stories in June. You know? Yeah, yeah. But uh, Right. Uh, but it, it really worked out. And, and one of the stories that was in it was by Juliet Hill. And it was titled uh, The Christmas Spirit of Starlight Cove. Mm -hmm. And it sold 1,400, and it was just a short story now. It sold 1,400 copies in August in the UK. Wow. The first year it was out. We were Googling it to see if Starlight Cove was maybe like a Coney Island over there. Mm -hmm. Because why were they reading this? I mean, it was clearly a Christmas story. The word Christmas was, you know, right there in mm -hmm. the the title, and it still sells. It sold thousands and thousands of copies. And we've churned out a Christmas treasury every year since. And they, all, if they buy one, they buy them all. Wow. And we we market it both as the anthology and then each of the stories individually, unless they're just really too short to put up. Mm -hmm. But uh, And that gives us the ability to reach um, 
buyers that want to pay 99 cents for a story and buyers that want to pay more. The anthologies are 3.99. Mm-hmm. So, uh, and we've made money on every one of them, a considerable amount of money because Christmas is just, mm-hmm. but that was just a happenstance. It was a good, it was my idea, but it was a good idea. I had no idea how good an idea <laughs> at first. And then the other thing that really did help us was that the book that I brought out as Chocolate Can Kill had been a Malice Domestic finalist mm-hmm. under another name. Mm. And I was, I really held it back. I, I was at a crossroads. I, had saved already three domain names, Mm -hmm. and I really did not intend to self-publish that book at first. I held it back, and I brought it out the following February 12th, and I had maybe... I want to say 200 friends on Facebook. I know I didn't have much over a thousand Twitter followers, Mm -hmm. but I had joked about, can you write chocolate off as an office expense? Can you, (laughs) you know, as, as we were getting ready, Angel did a cover that was just perfect for a cozy mystery. Um, it's a chocolate that's, you know, opened up and blood's coming out of it. You know? <laughs> but it, but it really with doilies, you know. But it it was a perfect cover. Chocolate King kills a great title for a cozy mystery. Uh, it's interesting. Eighty five percent of the women's bios that I was seeing at that time on Twitter had the word chocolate in them. Oh, I'm a chocoholic. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know that kind of thing. I'm a reformed chocoholic. Whatever. So it just really appealed. We brought it out. We were so stupid. We brought it out on February 12th, which is the dead time of the year. Mm-hmm. From Feb- from Valentine's Day to April 15th, we sell books, but it's really the low point. And we brought it out then. On April 22nd, it was number one in Cozy Mysteries on the Barnes & Noble website, and eventually was number one on the whole website, mm-hmm. beating out James Patterson, <laughs> everyone, and did similarly over on uh, Amazon. And it just, you know, we just, we we were able to market it through Twitter, you know, to where we got it there. And I was very lucky the Twitter followers I had retweeted and retweeted, and then their people retweeted, and pretty soon you're reaching millions of people. <laughs> yeah, and, and you know yeah. what? It's kind of funny because I, I'm not sure if you're aware of this, but in a way you're doing some SEO marketing, which do you even know what that is? I have a vague idea. Okay. But it's, I'm, I'm very serious when I say vague. Yeah, well, still, <laughs> it's, it, it's kind of like it's kind of like picking up on things that are already trending, okay? And the fact right. that you did that with the chocolate thing and you realized that women would be interested in a book like that, you, you've connected all the dots, and uh, it, it's really amazing. And speaking of women, I mean, you started a group called uh, From Women's Pens, a cooperative of women writers. Um, tell us a little bit about that group. Well, basically, the founding members were all women that I knew from various writers groups Mm -hmm. who had at least some work published by AA Pub. Um, Many of them just a short story in one of the anthologies, because we've done other anthologies too, romance anthology. We did a Spirited Tales anthology that has um, some time travel. It has some paranormal, um, that sort of thing uh, in it. Um, and anyway, they were, uh, they were women, obviously, <clears throat> and their work had been published by AA Pub. And as we've added projects for other female authors, their names have also been added to the role, uh, be- primarily because they meet the basic standards we believe the group represents. Mm. There's, we have worked very hard to build the Annie Acorn brand, uh, mm-hmm. the I- a Tired Older Woman brand, and the From Women's Pens, and now From Gents' Pens as well, mm-hmm. with the men. We picked them up when we started putting out the horror. <laughs> yeah. yeah, we do like our blood and guts. And the, yeah. <laughs> and the Westerns, you know, those, those are the men. And some nonfiction as well. And and even a fun uh, novel from Australia. But uh, basically, we wanted certain standards. We're not Christian authors, but we tend to appeal to Christian readers because mm-hmm. most of our works 
the vast majority of them, do not have a lot of foul language in them. They don't have a tremendous amount of violence in them. Now, of course, the horror and the Westerns, they'll mm-hmm. go there. And we have a thriller, Who's Minding America, written by D.A. Grady, which is about terrorists and North Koreans and gun control. <laughs> and <laughs> it goes pretty far with that. But And so we, we've tried to build the both the fact that if you buy one of these books, you're chances are you're getting the kind of book you're looking for and they're not always out there there's there's there are people who want more of that and i have no problem with that uh we have a blush series we've done some of it but it's the smallest part of our our listings uh the vast majority of them are going to appeal to people who are looking for a hallmark netflix christmas kind of feel to their romance, women's fiction, if that makes any sense. Oh, yeah. I grew up in the uh, 90s, all right? Uh, We used to love Saturday morning cartoons, and in just Mm -hmm. about every one of those shows, there was a moral to the story. And honestly, it's something that's really missing with a lot of books nowadays. And I I think it's great that you have brought that back because really, when when you're reading a book, it doesn't matter if it's a mystery. It doesn't even matter if it's a horror story. Having that moral of the story or even a resolution that, that makes the reader feel like, you know what, I'm taking more than just this story away. Um, It's important because it doesn't happen very often. I commend you for that immensely because it takes a lot of courage to do that in this type of market Um, because it is – it's a hard thing to do. Now, as far as marketing goes, you've talked about your marketing strategies a little bit. Um, As far as like the the books that you currently have out now, what are some of the marketing strategies that you have used? Well, all of the basics. I mean, blogging, joining Facebook groups, attending book fairs, doing interview signings, and last but certainly not least, uh, tweeting. Mm-hmm. The average ebook, and most authors are not going to want to hear me say this, never sells over seven copies. Hmm. There are now well over five million books available on Amazon. Mm-hmm. No one is ever going to trip over your book. So you have to market it. The best thing I ever read on the role of marketing in the life of an author was basically, it literally went through this, and I'm paraphrasing, and I don't even honestly remember the name of the woman who wrote it, but she was an ex-publicist back in the 90s. And what she said was basically once you have written, rewritten, edited, allowed your uh, work in progress to grow cold, edit it again, passed it out of beta readers and writers group members, edited it qu- again, queried it, secured an agent, signed with a publisher, worked with your editor, rewritten to their specifications, and proofed your book. You are now on the 50-yard line. <laughs> yeah, that's and about right. For the, right. And for the rest of your natural life, you will market your book. Wow. Now, our mantra at AA Pub is that if you tweet it, it will sell, and if you don't, it won't. Mm-hmm. Okay? Research has shown that a potential buyer must see a tweet with the book's Amazon buy page link and a cover JPEG attached mm-hmm. seven to ten times on average before they will even click on the buy link. Mm-hmm. And then they may click on that buy page link seven to ten more times before they will buy the book. Mm-hmm. Okay? And for a while, that worked really well. If you just, you know, sales or sales or sales. I have sold cemetery plots, okay? I mm-hmm. have sold caskets. <laughs> sales, <laughs> sales are sales are sales. It's how many times you're going to knock on the door to find a willing buyer for the product that you have in your hand. Mm-hmm. If you throw enough mud at the barn, eventually some of it will stick. Mm-hmm. And so, Every product is different. It may be that where chocolate can kill because it went was a genre book with a great title and a wonderful cover and a good book. Um, you know, it sold very quickly. And, you know, it took, you know, seven to ten times it was going to sell a copy. Okay. Mm-hmm. Where 
another book, uh, other books of my own even, have taken maybe, for instance, my Lunar Lake Cabin series. Some of those were out there for two years before they really started selling more than one, maybe a week. Mm -hmm. And now they sell several a day and at times hundreds a day. <laughs> okay, it depends on the time of the year. Mm -hmm. So some things just take longer. Um, but if you do it over and over and over and over and over again, because every time you tweet, someone else is going to retweet it, mm -hmm. you know, eventually you're going to reach literally millions of people. Mm-hmm. And in that millions of people, there will be somebody who will say, you know, that that cover, that title, whatever. The other thing, though, that you really must do, one thing people probably will not believe is, is when they see how many tweets are on my Annie Acorn Twitter page, <laughs> is that um, I don't use a service. Mm -hmm. I have tweeted every one of those tweets myself. Mm -hmm. And... I don't always, but I make it a point to be sure and do at least some literally connecting with my Twitter followers, mm -hmm. really engaging them. Give, I, one night, not too long ago, I actually tweeted out, well, I feel like I gave a really good writing course tonight because I had been on there and I just sat there and, you know, as people said, I'm having trouble with this. Can anybody help me? I just answered and we had strings of tweets and I think, some people really learn something. Another thing I do is I have, oh, I don't know, 15 to 20 Word doc pages mm -hmm. of writing tips that I tweet out through that Twitter page. Wow. And honestly, and do you do like public speaking things? I have more in the past than I do now. Okay. Well, I'm just saying you got it. All right. <laughs> you, you, you got all the information that anybody, I mean, anybody who's just tuning into this show, let's say this is the very first show you've ever heard of the Emmett Blackwell show. I have to tell you guys straight up, this information that Andy Acorn is giving out is extremely important to your marketing, to how you build up your characters, avoiding uh, writer's block. All of that information. I mean, really, Annie, you, you have a wealth of information, a wealth of experience that has kind of lent you down this path of, of being a mentor to so many people. Um, it's amazing to me. Well, it's very rewarding to me. Yeah. <laughs> I, mean, I feel like I, I've been very lucky. I mean, there were some key people along the way. One of the writers' groups, uh, we, might, we moved 19 times in 20 years. Oh, yeah, only 19? Yeah. <laughs> right. No, we literally did. My husband was a retail manager for Kmart and then Walmart, and he was very good at opening new stores. Mm -hmm. So they kept moving us around the Deep South. One of the writers' groups that I attended years ago was in Albany, Georgia, and they just had a wonderful program they split themselves in two one was a group of people who just wanted to be authors and the others were all published authors and the published authors mentored the smaller group mm -hmm. and um, there was one woman who wrote with us at the time famous uh, romance author this was years ago I won't give you the year I'll date myself <laughs> too badly <laughs> but, but anyway one thing I remember her telling me was always include scents, aromas, smells, odors in your book because the more senses of the reader that you can engage, the more they're going to feel like they're part of your story. And scent is, is a very strong one. I mean, I can use a word and you may take a different meaning out of it. But if I say, you know, that the scent of roses filled the air, you're immediately going to know what that air smelled like mm -hmm. because you've smelled roses. You know, if you if I put the aroma of cooking beef, you know, greeted her when she opened the door, there you are, mm -hmm. you know. <laughs> and it's just a way to pull that reader into the story. Mm-hmm. And that was a wonderful tip, and it's helped me, I think, engage my readers over the years. I hope it has. I feel like it has. Um, another thing that has helped me is the fact that I was in theater for early on in my life, and so I always visualize my characters as walking on a stage, mm -hmm. and I'm amazed by how many submissions I've received over the years and how many things I've reviewed for other people just trying to help them, and they'll have... 
Well, one of them had what had to have been an octagonal room <laughs> because wow. she had things on so many walls, you know, and she was talking about windows, but then there were bookcases and there was a table in the middle and then there was a desk and then there was, I was like, nobody can get around, nobody could live in this room. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and I made her literally draw it. You know. uh, yeah, that would be. <laughs> <laughs> because I said, and you you can't have someone come in on the right side of the stage and suddenly they're over at the left. They have to have a reason to walk across. Mm-hmm. And people don't think of this. That's one of the. I think that's one of the things that most clearly tells me when I'm reading, and I do read them for my sins. Um, <laughs> indie indie published books that have not had good uh, professional editing applied to them mm-hmm. uh, is that kind of fault in the book. It isn't It isn't typos, it isn't misspelled words, it isn't whatever. It's that. They, they don't move their characters around on that stage or see them as if they're on a film or on TV. You know, they've got to move, you know, mm-hmm. act it out. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> you know? Yeah, I'm I'm sure that there's some authors out there, and and one thing I can tell all you authors out there, uh, from experience is the one thing that works the best is reading it out loud to yourself. If you have to act it out in front of a mirror, that just makes it more fun. Uh, but yeah, <laughs> read it out loud. Get engaged with the story that you've just written because it really does uh, make a difference to a reader when they know. I mean, just like you said, you've read stories and you've read good ones, you've read bad ones. It really does make a difference when it's done correctly or at least they've edited it out so that it does make more sense. But um, I do have one more question. I might have to put you on the hot plate for this one. Oh, dear. <laughs> All right. Are you willing to participate in a game with me? Oh, I'll do it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. We have a different game here on the Emmett Blackwell Show. This is the Word Association game. I'm going to give it a fancy name, though. It's going to be the Mega Ultra Super Word Association game. (laughs) Here's how it works. No (laughs) pressure. No pressure at all. (laughs) Here's how it works. Each player will choose 10 words, okay? The opponent must associate each word with another word, excluding any words that start with a particular letter. So, for example, if I chose uh, the word apple and you said barbecue sauce. Don't know why you would say barbecue sauce, but okay, you say barbecue sauce. And I said, but my letter is excluding anything B. And I'll tell you that before the game starts. So are you ready? I'm not sure if I'm ready, but I'm willing. (laughs) (laughs) Okay, I'm going to begin, and then you can quiz me afterwards. You have your 10 uh, words already? Oh, I I can come up with 10 words. I'm a a writer. (laughs) (laughs) She's got the best words. (laughs) All right, here we go. And uh, anything that starts with the letter B will be excluded. Okay? Okay. All right, so here's the first word. Cat. Dog. Shelf. Book. Ah, there's one for you. All right, cool. All right, next one. Running. Walking. Okay. Reindeer. Christmas. Oh, that's a good one. That's a good one. Uh, golden. Power. Hmm. Um, okay. Mushroom. Kill. Grand. Central. Happy. And ten. Leftover. Or leftover. Abundant. Okay. And last one. Machine. Made. Okay. Cool. So that was the first <laughs> round. Now, you only had Slow. one point. That's okay. Hey, <laughs> you did really good. This is the first time we're trying this on the show. So go ahead and give me your ten words. And which letter are you excluding? R. Okay. R. Okay. Go ahead. Trees. Uh, leaves. Fish. Uh, trout. Cookies. Uh, chocolate. Water. Frozen. Walk. 
Run. Ah, goo. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you got me. Okay. Uh, so there's one for me. All right. Keep going. All right. Mountain. Um, hills. Pie. Um, apple. Path. Um, trail. Music. Oh, <laughs> I, almost said, I almost said something worse. I almost said rock. Uh, uh, classical. House. Oh. Uh, Adobe. <laughs> that would work. Adobe. All right. Anything else? Nope, that's 10. Oh, okay. So we're one for one. That's pretty good. I'm good with that. <laughs> I, you know, I've never tied on this because we've never played on this game. Um, but it was very entertaining. <laughs> it was fun. And, uh, Annie, I tell you what, though, you really are a plethora of knowledge. You, you're... Uh, That's because I'm old. <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't going to say it. I wasn't going to say it, no. Well, when you live a certain number of years, you know, you pick up a little something. <laughs> God help you if you haven't learned anything. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, no, we got, no. No, it's horrible. So anyhow, um, so where can people find uh, your books? Well, uh, you mean where are they available to be purchased? Yeah. Or where can they find uh, they're on Amazon, iTunes, Barnes & Noble, Kobo, mm -hmm. uh, which now uh, I understand Walmart is selling the Kobo readers as well. Mm -hmm. um, Kobo traditionally handles what people think of as the um, old British Empire. So we pick up Australia buyers and New Zealand and South Africa, a lot of European buyers through that vehicle. Mm -hmm. Then there are many of them are now also on Audible mm -hmm. and iTunes in that form as well. And um, the print books now, well, they've always been available through Amazon and can be found through Barnes & Noble as well and, you know, independent bookstores and wherever. So, and then um, Annie Acorn Publishing, uh, what's the website for that? Uh, AnnieAcornPublishing.com. All right. And what's your Twitter handle? It's at Annie, A-N-N-I-E underscore acorn a-c-o-r-n all right and thank you so much for being here on the show annie it was really a pleasure well it was very fun to do it i enjoyed it <laughs> and this is emma blackwell signing out keep on reading and keep on writing my friends searching the web for the most talented creative and intriguing independent authors The Emmett Blackwell Show, diving into the creative minds of sci-fi, fantasy, horror, and paranormal authors. Their fantasy is our reality. <laughs> <laughs>